started bleeding. And uh, they had an ultrasound and discovered I had a, a pretty good sized tumor in the left kidney and did surgery the next day. And uh, the, kidney, the uh, cancer was entirely contained in the left kidney. And they said not to worry, I wasn't going to get cancer back. And then five years later, we found out that I had a lung full of metastases. Uh, and I was on chemotherapy for 13 months, and I had an open chest surgery for a few spots that were not uh, cleared out by the chemo. And uh, then um, about every three years since then, I've had uh, one spot show up in the lung one at a time. And there's been about four spots since then. And I just had scans uh, two weeks ago, and currently I don't have any evidence of anything new. And I became more withdrawn. Uh, I became more isolated. I started gaining weight. Um, uh, I just was kind of in a downward spiral, losing interest in things. Just most of the classical uh, uh, depression symptoms, you know, sleep disturbance, you know, uh, you know, mild eating disorder. It was getting to the point where my daughter and friends were saying, you know, you need to do something because you're just kind of becoming a curmudgeon, you know, you're getting too isolated and too uh, withdrawn. The, I think the topic of my depression came up with my daughter and with friends off and on for two or three years before uh, I saw the uh, ad for the John Hopkins research study and in the meantime I had gone into individual counseling once or twice for you know 10 to 12 sessions each time and I had tried uh, two different uh, antidepressant medications. During that three years that uh, before I went to John Hopkins and I was what I would call a, uh, a chronic low-level depression, uh, I was clearly having trouble sleeping. Uh, I was up uh, a couple times a night. Um, I was uh, had, I was pretty sad most of the time, low self-esteem. Uh, I was not uh, being very sociable except with my very closest friends, not dating. Uh, it was pretty much me and the dog. It wasn't much of a life. I mean, I was well aware that I was depressed and that it was, uh, I was kind of vegetating. I mean, I had all my excuses and explanations, of course, but if, if you stood just 10 feet back from it, you could see it was depression. <laughs> I'd had marijuana back in the 70s about three times, and uh, once it was uh, a very pleasant experience, and then the second two times it was, uh, it, uh, it wasn't pleasant. Uh, I got a little paranoid. Uh, I kind of uh, was at a party and I kind of withdrew and didn't, it was not, and that was it. I never mm -hmm. tried it again. And I had no previous experience with uh, uh, LSD or psilocybin. I didn't try drugs other than those three times with the marijuana because I was very familiar with a lot of uh, bad consequences of taking them. I, on, on occasion I would be doing night duty in the emergency room and people would come in on a bad trip or they've overdosed on something and you know these people were terrified. It was, didn't look like a real fun nor productive experience. For them. You get to John Hopkins, you go uh, and have an extensive assessment medically and psychologically. Uh, then you have three days of working with the two researchers, uh, one of which was a PhD therapist, psychologist, and you, be, you get to know them really well over three days, because it's the better part of three days, and so they learn all of your history, you get a, uh, a real sense of comfort with them, a real sense of trust. And under the influence of the drug, they're with you the whole day. And 
it turned out that that was really valuable because had they not been there uh, in the initial phases of the thing, I was so uh, frightened that I would have bolted and that would have been the end of the whole thing. Well, when you first take the high dose, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes for it to start, uh, to start feeling the effects. The, after about 15 minutes, the, your, your sense of reality just starts going offline. I wanted to try and get everything to snap back into place. I wanted to make things seem familiar again because it was just becoming more and more unfamiliar and frightening actually. And, uh, and at that point I realized that there was no turning back. When I would do the meditation it seemed to almost make it worse. And so what I really wanted to do was open my eyes and get up and move around. But the two people that were in the room were pretty good. They kept me relatively calm and uh, it took about an hour and a half for me really to calm down and to kind of become tranquil. There's just no longer any construct, any sense of ego at all. So there's really no fright because there's nothing sort of left to lose, if you will. I kind of describe it, I've described it before as kind of like falling off a sailboat. And you fall off the sailboat and you come back up to the surface and you look around and the boat's gone. And then shortly after that the water's gone. And then shortly after that you're gone, but you're still conscious. It was very valuable that that the that the whole process was so closely supervised because I would have gotten up and tried to leave the room and get outside if I hadn't had the people there with me and I hadn't had confidence in them that that I was going to come out on the other side of it in one piece the psychologist in particular uh, just sat next to me and uh, kind of was in physical contact with me and of course I had no sense of time. It could have been 10 minutes or six hours. I had no idea. And he said afterwards that he just kind of sat there and had his arm around my shoulder for about an hour. And he was just being quiet. He wasn't uh, saying anything in particular. I couldn't make out voices anyway, so. Uh, but I did have a sense of him being physically present at some point. Then you're just kind of in this calm, tranquil, curious space and when I was in that space, I had, at one point, I had some sense of being in a cathedral at one time, and I thought, well, uh, I'll ask God, you know, I said, you know, if there's ever a time you want to talk to me, this is it. And I didn't say that out loud, I was just thinking that, kind of. And, uh, and nothing happened, I did it again, and nothing happened, so I just dropped that. At another point, when I was right in the middle of it, I had a sense of living on the surface of a bubble and through the thickness of a bubble, a very large bubble. And that was my living space, and other people had other living spaces nearby me. It's about it. It was, there was no sense of being drugged or anything. It was just crystal clear, lucid uh, curiosity, just, you know, but, but no hallucinations, no colors, no know anything, just a void. I could pull up out of memory, past memory and current memory, uh, any relationship I'd ever had and I could objectively kind of do a review of it, I could like re-experience it, but without there being any sort of ego involved, it was just, uh, and there was a lot of sadness in that too, you know, failed relationship time feelings and stuff like that. It wasn't entirely clear to me that I was going to make it back into everyday reality or that if I went back into everyday reality it would make sense because it seemed it seemed uh, less significant or less real somehow and I was thinking kind of as a psychologist at that moment I'm wondering if this is what happens with schizophrenics or you know where everyday reality doesn't mean the same thing to them anymore and that's a lot of why they're acting the way they are. But five or six times I would intentionally move from everyday reality back to the void and I could do that because I was kind of halfway in between and I could kind of control it a little bit. And It was like I was trying to leave these breadcrumbs, you know, that <laughs> follow the track back, you know.
And as it turned out, that was really helpful because now when I do meditation, I can get back to a semblance of that experience in just uh, you know five or ten minutes. But as a function of the uh, psilocybin, I came away with a uh, kind of a spontaneous trust and intuition. And it was sort of like I made this discovery that there was this whole body of, of information and knowledge that I could trust uh, that I wasn't producing in my head. Um, and that was quite a shock. It was quite a surprise. Spiritually, I had minored in contemporary theology and always my approach to religion had always been highly intellectual. Uh, and uh, with this, the, uh, uh, the experience of, uh, of uh, the spiritual side has become very personal. Uh, you know, it's a felt experience rather than an intellectual experience. And my sense of self has changed quite a bit. I don't any longer see myself as the sort of linguistic construct that I used to see myself as, you know, the descriptive self, the doctor or the, you know, 240 pounds. As a result of that, I, I don't manage my life very much anymore. I mean, I, I have preferences values, but I don't have much in the way of goals anymore because one of the things that became very clear to me after this was I was getting stuck on my goals. I would create a goal and then I'd pursue it for years and in the meantime I wouldn't be living, you know. I, I, would, uh, I would have this idea in my head about how my life ought to be running and in the meantime my life was running over here and I wasn't paying attention to it. You know, my organic dynamic self was over here and my idea of who I was was over here and who I needed to be and where I needed to be in two years from now. And I was getting stuck in that for two and three and four years at a time and I wasn't having much of a life. Also it became very clear to me that adult relationships, intimate relationships, don't need to be managed. If you just show up with kind of a natural enthusiasm, if you have some capacity for being a good listener and some basic ability for attunement and empathy, that relationships just happen naturally. And uh, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I never ran my relationships that way. I always <clears throat> thought that I needed to be be somebody, have a persona of some sort, that I needed to manage how things went. When I finished the high dose and I got my exit interview with Roland, the director, he said at that time that I needed to give myself the space to unpack the whole experience. I didn't have any idea what he meant by that at the time. But as it turned out that all kinds of, of uh, changes occurred, events occurred in my life that just occurred spontaneously that seemed to be a product of a different way of my approaching life. The movement, the move from the intellectual to the intuitive. Well, I talked to uh, the John Hopkins people about doing it again, you know, doing a subsequent study right after I did it. I wasn't clear in my own mind that I wanted to do it again because it was, among other things, frightening. Roland uh, actually said, well, a lot of people, once they've had the experience, don't ever really need to do it again because it is all so fresh in your mind and you never forget it. ago from Texas where it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is here you can just it, it kind of freaked me out to be able to walk the street and there's you know mentally ill people uh, 
physically disabled people and of course as I learned recently families uh, entire families uh, just on the street you know who's going to take care of them and how I mean some uh, so many people just can't help their situation and it's just getting worse it's estimated in the state of Washington in 2009 over 100,000 families and individuals faced homelessness in King County on a particular given night, 23,000 people are homeless, and 2,500 of those are on the street, individuals and families with nowhere to stay. In January of 2009, the community came together and identified how many homeless families with children there were in our county at that time. In that particular night, there were over 3,500 An individual would need to work 75 hours a week in a retail job to afford the typical one or two bedroom apartment here on the east side. If you were going to work a 40 hour week, you need to have a wage of $22.40. Today, July 23rd, 2004, I was getting ready to make a left hand turn. It was a beautiful sunny day and I was hit. She tried to pass me, it was like I didn't exist. For some reason, they stopped paying my benefits and it shouldn't have happened. They misinterpreted a doctor's letter. It's not just drugs and alcohol that make people homeless. It's life and life can change. Also, besides the hard work that families put into finding shelters, the calling every day, several times a day, even with all that work that they do, a lot of times it is the luck of the draw. It's the makeup of the family. I had one family, two parents, two children, no substance abuse problems, no domestic violence. And the mom said, Nancy, we're just a normal family. We can't find any shelter. Um, Lately, the waits have been two months to get into a shelter. And the face of a homeless family is any face, and it's almost a full-time job to be homeless. And while that family is waiting for a shelter or some, some place to call home or to sleep, imagine, just for a moment, if you were in that situation, you had no money, no money coming in, no place to go home to, no place to go to, to close the door on the world, even for a minute. You're not even sure where you're going to go to the bathroom next. Where do you store your clothes for tomorrow? What happens to your special trinkets that we all have, whether it be a piece of jewelry, your child's drawing that they made for you years ago, a gift from one of your parents as a child. What happens to those items? Mentally, when do you regroup? Physically, when do you get to rest? And emotionally, when do you heal? This homelessness is something we can all do, do something about. We can be part of the solution. This is about the Kensington Mine Project. It's near Lower Slate Lake in Alaska. The dispute is, that, is about what is happening there breaks the EPA's 1975 Clean Water Act. Guess what? It's allowed by the Supreme Court's findings of this year. The 1975 Clean Water Act prohibits discharge of toxins into water 
in order to restore our rivers and lakes to useful and use usable capacity. It has been the intent, it has the intent of making our water drinkable again. A generation of people have been working on cleaning up our environment from the radiation at Love Canal to our streams that were filled with bacteria and heavy metals that would make people ill and kill plants and animals. Our progress in cleaning up our environment was positive. During the Bush administration, pollution was redefined as filler material. This gave the Army Corps of Engineers the opportunity to use Lower Slate Lake in Alaska as a waste dump for the Kensington Mines lead, mercury, and other caustic chemicals. Tom Waldo, an attorney for Earth Justice, fought the case with the Supreme Court of our United States. The Supreme Court voted six to three to allow this dumping to happen. Is this a slippery slope for the rest of our country? Yes is the answer from conservation agencies and others such as the scientists who've, who have been involved in this. 200,000 gallons a day of toxic discharge will go into Slate Lake. After 10 years, which is the lifespan of most mines, uh, there will be four and a half tons of solids left in the lake. All life is estimated to have died out at the beginning of the use of the lake as a toxic waste dump. The bed of the lake will be raised by the four and a half tons of toxins and will spread out to three times its size. It will be larger and shallower according to some scientists' findings. It will fill up with the mine tailings. The specific effect is expected to be that it will be highly toxic. The mine is required to put four inches of natural soil, four inches, over the waste at the end of the 10 years. It is not likely, according to scientists, that the lake will recover. If it does, it is estimated to take many decades. President Obama can rescind this mine permit. It is important if you want this to happen to let our president know your wishes. Whatever you decide, I hope you make your voice heard and tell your legislators. Okay, now what about that slippery slope? According to the National Wildlife Federation, this alters the Clean Water Act framework. Up to 60% of the nation's stream miles have lost or at risk for losing vital protection. More than 20 million acres of wetlands have effectively lost federal water pollution safeguards. A generation of progress in cleaning U.S. waters may be lost. Congress presently has a Clean Water Restoration Act before it. Let your federal representatives know what you want. Make your voices heard. For more information, go to www.nwf.org slash courting disaster or www.treehugger.com.
Mother, we know.